going to share with you some intimate details about my life that I believe are going to help our viewers and really bring some healing into you. My father, whom I was supposed to be able to trust, who was supposed to keep me safe, raped me a minimum of 200 times before I became 18. How can that have happened to me and me stand here before you today in the condition I'm in today if God is not alive and well? I was sexually, mentally, emotionally, and verbally abused by my father as far back as I can remember until I finally left home at age 18. Abuse means to be misused, used improperly, to be used up or to be wasted. To use in such a way as to cause harm or damage or to be treated cruelly. People listening or people here today may have been sexually, emotionally, mentally, physically, or verbally abused, but all types of abuse are damaging. Anytime we're misused or used for a purpose other than which God intended us for, it is damaging. My father did many perverted things, and you can believe me today when I tell you that I'm only gonna tell you a few. There are some that would be way too distasteful for me to try to talk about in a crowd like this. He made me look through the keyhole and watch him and my mother having sex, and then I was supposed to tell him how it made me feel. If I walked into a room where he was and nobody else was in there, he would grab himself or reveal his private parts as if that was supposed to excite me. Anytime he had opportunity, he grabbed me in personal places, so I despised even having to go into a room where he was at. And I remember when I was at home, my greatest goal was to stay out of the space he was in. If he would go to the basement or the garage to do some work, he would tell me to wait five or ten minutes and then come where he was at, act as if I was looking for him, and then he would molest me in those situations, touching me and make me touch him. I was continually fearful that my mother would come in the room and catch him and blame me. When he was going to go places in the car, he told me to beg to go with him in front of my mother, and then he would tell me no, and then I was supposed to keep trying to get him to let me go until he finally gave in, and so it's kind of interesting. He had this thing all set up to where it looked like it was me. I, of course, did not really want to go because I knew what was going to happen if I went, but I had to do what I was told. My mother went to the grocery store every Friday morning, and I so desperately wanted to go with her, and he would make me beg to stay home or make an excuse about why I couldn't go. And then, while she was gone, he would rape me. When we went swimming, I had to ask him to teach me to swim so he could take me out in the water and put his hands on me. There was no place where I ever felt safe when I was growing up. I don't think we even begin to imagine the damage that does to a child because children first and foremost should always feel safe. And I never felt safe. And I know that many of you, you've had these same experiences. For some of you, I'm just like telling your life story today. He wanted me to bring girls home from school so he could try to do things to them. I managed to make excuses for all the girls at school, but he did abuse the girl that lived next door to us a few times. She and I were friends, and I remember my father making me get her into a place where he could be alone with her, and then he'd tell me to go off and wait in another area while he did things to her, and I was so, so profoundly ashamed and embarrassed. I was ashamed of me. I was ashamed of my parents. I was ashamed of what they did. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I understood the the problem of shame and when you're ashamed of who you are how that poisons all your thoughts and your actions and I'm so grateful that the Word of God says that for your former shame I will give you a double reward I will give you a twofold recompense let me tell you something if you were raised right you ought to go by and kiss your parents three times every day. 
if you were even remotely raised right, even a little bit raised right, amen? Sexual abuse is so shaming that nobody talks about it. Nobody knows how to talk about it. After my father abused my friend, she and I would get back together and her and I wouldn't even talk about it. When I think back now, it just makes me kind of scratch my head and think. That's just such a unique thing to me that it's just, it's such an awful thing that nobody even knows how to talk about it. At school, I pretended to have a normal life, but I felt lonely all the time and I felt different all the time. Never felt like I fit in. I couldn't make friends with anybody. I was never allowed to participate in an after-school activity. Never went to a ball game of any kind, no kind of a sports activity. Couldn't take part in anything. I had only so many minutes to get home from school because my father always suspected that I might be out doing something with a boy. It's kind of interesting that guilt always breeds suspicion. Had no friends, and of course I was never allowed to date. I never attended a party. My father would not buy me a graduation dress, a class ring, or senior pictures. He thought all those things were stupid and a waste of money. So then I had to try to explain to my classmates why I never got to do the things that they got to do, never came to anything, never went to anything, couldn't get a class ring, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. And so that was more pretense and making up more stories. and It was just awful, just absolutely awful. I remember a time when I was really young and they had a Halloween party at school and my mom didn't know any better and she didn't have much money anyway and she bought me this ugly rubber wolf mask. And when all the other little girls showed up, their moms had made them princess costumes and they were little fairies and they had all this chiffon and they all looked so beautiful and I had my wolf mask. And I remember going and hiding in the corner of the schoolyard because I felt so terrible about the way I looked. It's interesting, the, the things that you remember. And I can remember being in that corner in that schoolyard just as plain with that old rubber wolf mask on. I think that's kind of the way I felt, like everybody else was a fairy princess and I was the wolf. I had a terrible, shameful secret that was eating me alive. So, what I learned that love was, was a pretty perverted thing. When I was about nine or ten years old, I remember my father taking him with me to the house of a female relative and telling me that he was going to have sex with her. And he told me how much she loved it, how good it was. All these things were to encourage me that it was an okay thing to do. And then he would tell me in detail the things that they did. I had to keep lots of secrets. He said everything he did was good and it had to be our secret. And if I told anybody, nobody would understand. They wouldn't believe me anyway and I would cause lots of problems in the family. It was interesting that I realized this morning it became my burden <laughs> not to cause any problems in the family because of my pain. And probably one of the single biggest things that I've had to deal with in my life and still to this day have to stand against it is a false sense of responsibility. Making myself responsible for things that I should not be responsible for at all. Let me tell you something, I will confront my problem and yours too if I know you have one. I make myself responsible for stuff that's just ridiculous. However, God's done a lot in me in that area, and I'm able to say, Joyce, that's not your responsibility. <laughs> you don't have to deal with that. How many of you know what I mean by a false sense of responsibility? Well, look at that. The reason why Satan wants us to keep everything hidden is because as long as it's hidden in you, you can never really get free from it, not completely. And so those things that you have hidden in you, if something you've done that you're ashamed of or something that was done to you that you're ashamed of, if you've never, ever, ever talked about it, you're not doing yourself a favor. Start by talking to God openly and honestly. Talk to yourself openly and honestly. 
You have to get it out to get over it. Some things I remember as I got older. When I was about 12 or 13, my father progressed from molestation to rape. He didn't force me physically, but he definitely forced me with fear and manipulation and control and threats and lies. And even having to get this ready this time has been interesting for me because never before in all the years of talking about this have I ever used the word rape. And when I first said it about three weeks ago preparing for this, it sounded so violent even to me because I always said sexual abuse. But I really believe that God put this in my heart because I do think that we've gotten anesthetized to the word sexual abuse. <laughs> and literally what he did was he raped me. And he did it every week, at least once a week, until the time I was 18. I did a little bit of math and realized that my father, whom I was supposed to be able to trust, who was supposed to keep me safe, raped me a minimum of 200 times before I became 18. Now, how can that have happened to me and me stand here before you today in the condition I'm in today if God is not alive and well on planet Earth. How is that possible without God? The biggest black eye that you can give the devil <laughs> is to give God your pain and let him turn it into gain. To give him your mess and let it become your message. Because, see, when I tell you that I know what it's like to hurt, you believe me. And when I tell you my testimony and I tell you that I am healed and whole and sane and well, and I've got a great marriage of 43 years and four kids that are serving God and 10 grandchildren, and that I love my life, and I think I'm being a value to the kingdom of God. Then that gives you hope. That gives you hope that God will do it for you. Amen. And that's why I'm doing this. Because I want, I want people to know how good God is. And that your struggle is worth it. Your journey is worth it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Anyone who's been abused can fully recover fully recover now there are things that I will never have that sure I would have liked to have had I'll never know what it's like to have a great dad I'll never know what it's like to be able to sit on my dad's lap put my arms around his neck and just get a hug without fear that it's going to turn into something else I'll never be able to be hurting and ask my dad to go have coffee with me and sit down and just tell him what I'm going through and have him really care I'll never have that. But I have something better. Because I have a walk with God and a relationship with God that is the absolute most wonderful and precious thing in the whole world. And the Bible says in Psalm 27:10, even if your mother and father forsake you, I will take you up and adopt you, and I will make you my own child. Amen? He didn't physically hit me that much, but he would always threaten. Like, I remember him putting his fist in my face. Like, every time I would do something, he didn't want that threat was there. You know? And still to this day, I can't stand it if somebody gets their hands too close to my face. You know, it's like, don't do that. <laughs> he was a controller. Everything had to be his way. In addition to being abused, my father was just plain mean. He controlled everything. We had to like what he liked, go to bed when he went to bed, get up when he got up, watch what he wanted to watch on television. We even had to eat what he liked, and we had to laugh at his dirty jokes. He was angry a lot of the time, and we all feared that he was always angry at us. 
That's another thing that I still have to stand against today. If I'm around somebody and it's somebody I'm close to, if they seem angry, I'll automatically wonder, what did I do? And then I have to talk to myself and say, wait, wait, wait. You see, that's the great thing about God. You have an option. <laughs> you don't have to just react. You can catch yourself reacting to old information and you can now act upon the Word of God. I became ashamed of myself because of what was being done to me and I grew up very lonely. He took me with him to bars on Saturday night when I got into my teenage years where he would get very drunk and he'd force me to have sex with him in the back seat of the car. Once a police officer caught him and I thought, finally, somebody's going to help me. I was so glad. But he and my father talked outside the car for a while and my dad finally told me, he said, I told him you're my cousin and he promised to let us go if I would let him have sex with you so you're going to just have to do it because otherwise we're going to end up going to jail. Well, thank God the police officer got a call on his radio and I got out of that one. A couple times I tried to tell relatives in the family but they all said they didn't believe me because they didn't want to get involved. One time my mother went to the hospital and I wrote my father a long letter telling him how dirty all this made me feel and how many baths I took a day trying to get rid of the feeling and took all the courage that I could possibly muster to write him a letter asking him to stop. And he worked nights so he got home around midnight and man he came in my room ranting and raving and so mad and so I ended up just out of fear apologizing to him and telling him I should have never written the letter. So I guess when I finally tried to reach out to enough people and it became obvious nobody was going to help me, the police weren't going to help me, relatives weren't going to help me, I couldn't talk him out of it, I just finally settled in and thought I'm going to survive. One of the things I remember that was probably one of the most disgusting to me was when I got old enough to learn how to drive, my father would take me out every Sunday afternoon for a driving lesson. And of all the ridiculous places to take me to do what he was going to do to me was he took me to a graveyard. And that's where he'd have sex with me in the car. And if anyone came around, then we'd have to get out of the car and pretend like we were looking at graves and sick, 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 sick. He worked nights as a truck mechanic, and so I was at school most of the time during the day, and I only had to deal with him on the weekends, but I tell you, I hated summers. Couldn't wait to go back to school. Lots of mornings he'd come and wake me up and put his hands on me under the covers. Actually, my father didn't just have a problem with me. He had problems with lots of women, and there was lots and lots of women that he got into relationships with, and... It was really sad. I'm happy to say that God gave me the grace to completely 100% forgive my father. It took some time, but I was able to do it. And I had forgiven him, but I had not totally forgiven him. And I realized that when God asked me several years ago to bring my mom and dad to St. Louis from where they lived in southeast Missouri and move them close to our home and take care of them until they died. And I thought, you have got to be kidding. I mean, at first, I just rebuked it. I said, there is no way this is God. No loving, good God would ask me to do that. Because you see, I, they were in a place where I only had to deal with them a couple times a year. Go by on holidays, throw a little money at it, and try to keep it off my mind. God said, they're sick, they're old. I'm like, well, what did they ever do for me? And, and you know all he said? You're breathing. They came together and gave me a life and, oh, that was so hard for me. My God, that was hard for me to do. But I, by then, I had enough experience to know when God was dealing with me and I also know that God never tells us to do anything if it's not going to work out for our good. I want you to remember that. God will never tell you to do anything if it's not going to work out for your good. When we brought my father and mother to St. Louis to live, bought them a house, took almost all the money we had saved, 
had to get them a car. Their car was worn out. They had to have furniture. We had to send somebody over every week to get their groceries. Every time something needed to be repaired, we had to do it. We bought all their clothes. Three years went by, and there didn't seem to be hardly any change in my dad. And by then, he was at the point where he would try to go to church occasionally on holidays with us, and but he was still just as mean as a snake. And one Thanksgiving morning, my mother called and said, your dad would like you to come over. He wants to talk to you. She said, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's been crying for about three weeks. She said, I think I know, but you better come over. So David and I went over and he looked at me and he started crying and he said, I just need to tell you how sorry I am for what I did to you. And um, he said, I've been wanting to say something for three years, but I just wasn't man enough. I didn't have the guts to do it. And uh, he looked at Dave and he said, you know, most men in your position would have killed me. And you've never been anything but nice to me. And um, my father, by the way, received Christ that day. We baptized him 10 days later. Amen. And he died about three years ago, but I mean, that man was changed. I mean, he actually became a sweet old guy. I could actually kiss him on the cheek and not be afraid. And uh, so that was, that was a big black eye for hell. Where was God in all this? Let's talk about that for a minute. I prayed for my dad to die. That didn't happen. I prayed for my mother to leave him. That didn't happen. I prayed he'd leave me alone. That didn't happen. Why didn't God help me? I was praying. I was asking him. I was just an innocent little kid being abused. Well, you know what? I don't have the answers to all that, but I can tell you that by faith I now understand. That's why that scripture that I shared last night about by faith we understand how the world was made. You know, I, I, I can't explain it to you in my mind, but I know that God didn't get me out of it, but he did give me the strength to go through it. And listen, I remember when I was a teenager laying in bed at night, which was my favorite time when my dad was still at work to lay in bed when it was quiet. And in my little childish way, I would pray then and I would think someday I'm going to do something great. Someday I'm going to do something great. I believe that God puts a seed of greatness in everyone. I believe there's more capabilities inside of you than what you can even begin to imagine. But Satan tries to diminish us. He tries to demean us and belittle us through people mistreating us. But I want you to know today that even though I was being abused and abandoned, and it seemed that nobody was going to help me and that it would never end, right in the midst of that, God had a plan. God had a plan. And I cannot explain this to you, so don't even ask me to. But for years I said, of course, I wish that I would have never been abused. But God has helped me recover. And about three years ago, I said that, but of course, I wish I wouldn't have been abused. And God stopped me, he said, stop saying that. And then I, I thought about it and I thought, <laughs> and I know this sounds crazy, but I'm glad it happened. You know why? Because I'm a better person now than I ever would have been. I don't know how to make any sense out of that, but I know that I know that I know that God has redeemed me. And he has taken what Satan meant for harm and worked it out for good. And I'm a better person than I would have been had it not happened. And you can be too. I'm stronger. I know God better. I understand people's pain. And I believe it's, I believe that it's made me able to reach out to you in your pain and your need. And to tell you with all passion 
God is alive. He loves you. He's got a good plan for your life. And don't you ever doubt that. Don't ever doubt that. Can you recover? You're looking at somebody who did. Amen. You're looking at the evidence that you can recover. There's no pit so deep that he can't reach down in it and lift you out. Are we willing to even ask God to teach us how to love the way he loves? Because if we love the way God loves, that means that we're going to love when there's nothing in it for us. Hi, everybody. We're going to love when there's nothing in it for us, when it's just an all giving out. And I can tell you from experience, I know that it will win people to Christ and it will win some of the hardest people to Christ that you can imagine. I'm sure if you watch my TV program much, you've heard my story about my dad sexually abused me for many, 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 many years. My mother knew what was happening. She just was a very fearful woman who didn't know how to deal with him. And so she just let it happen. And so I was abused and abandoned. Later on, many years later, after I thought that I had totally forgiven, God put it in my heart that as they were getting older, that I needed to buy them a better house to live in and take really good care of them until they died. Well, that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do because the first thing that I said to God is, well, what did they ever do for me? He said, well, you're breathing, aren't you? <laughs> so the point is, is God wants us to be good to people who haven't done anything for us because that is the best way in the world that you can do spiritual warfare and keep the devil under your feet. Love is the highest form of spiritual warfare. If we think that we're doing something smart to stay mad at somebody and try to get revenge on them, it's the absolute worst thing that we can do for our own selves. It poisons our lives when we do that. And it's all based on feelings. Well, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. Well, I can tell you, I didn't feel like buying my mom and dad a house. And I started out trying to buy a cheap house and God said, no, you're going to buy a nice house. And it's not like we just had a bunch of money laying around to go buy people houses. It was going to take everything that we had. And so I thought, well, surely Dave would tell me no. That was going to be my out. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, well, if you think it's God, you better obey. And I was like, I don't want to obey. <laughs> Fast forward the story to the end. Took three years. of taking them to the doctor's. Making sure the bills all got paid, making sure the grass got cut, making sure somebody got their groceries, taking them to the doctor, on and on and on. And finally, one morning, my dad, my mother said, your dad's been crying all week. He wants you to come over, wants to tell you something. All these years, my father had never apologized to me, never even admitted what he did. And on that day, with tears, he said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you when you were a kid. He asked if we would pray with him. He received Christ. We baptized him 10 days later. <clears throat> and I always say this, I thought I was buying a house, but actually I was buying a soul. And I don't mean that in a wrong way. We know that Christ paid for our salvation. But you know, sometimes, well, let's put it like this. One of the main reasons why people don't walk in love is because love is an effort. And it will always, now get this, it will always cost you something. If it's real love, it's always going to cost something. It's going to cost some time, some effort, even to not start a fight in your home. It's going to cost you some pride. You're going to have to be willing to swallow your pride and let somebody else think they're right when you're pretty sure you're right, but you don't think it's worth starting a fight over because you know that God has said to keep the peace. Come on now. Oh, this is going to get better as the, as the sessions go by. 
it's not that you become a doormat. Love doesn't mean that you just let everybody walk all over you and you let everybody push you around. But here's what it does mean. You confront when God shows you to confront. And you wait on him when he tells you to wait on him. And I've found that when I do it like that, most of the time when God tells me to confront, I just soon leave it alone. And most of the time when I want to confront, he's telling me to leave it alone. When somebody has hurt us, one of the hardest things in the world is to wait and let God bring our vindication. When you shared your testimony, it, it's very easy to hear the fact that the feeling of isolation and abandonment is very important. So yeah. how were you able to work through that and not have those abandonment feelings just continue throughout your life and all your different relationships? Well, one thing is for sure, you know, anybody that's being mistreated, whether it's uh, a battered wife, um, a spouse who's been unfaithful, mm -hmm. parents who didn't love you properly or for whatever gave you the feeling they didn't want you. Right. There are even people who, who have been adopted that feel that way they don't understand they don't they don't have the knowledge of of why their birth parents didn't keep them and you know even they can go through a lot of stuff like that and one of the things that's so beautiful about a relationship with God is he is the God of all comfort and so it's really a supernatural thing that kind of goes beyond your brain when you enter a relationship with God he begins to comfort you in your life the important thing is to have your mind renewed. I mean, you really do. No matter what God wants to do for you, you have to learn how to think differently. And I really want to make sure that, that all of you get that. No matter what God wants to do for you, you have to learn to think differently. Romans 12, 1 and 2 t tells us that, that God's got a good plan for our life, but we will never experience that good plan unless our mind and attitude is completely renewed by the Word of God. And so uh, all of those feelings will change as you begin to study the Word. And and not only just study the Word, but you spend time with God. And, you know, people are always like, well, what do I do when I spend time with God? You know, it's not so much having a formula of what you do. It's about giving God the time. If you don't do anything but sit in a room and cry and say, God, I need you, <laughs> it's still very valuable because I think we honor God with that time, that regular time with Him. And then... Different things happen at different times. You know, you, you pray, you study, you sing, you cry, you think. But spending time with God is very important. And as you study the Word and you spend time with God, little by little, from glory to glory, gradually, all those bad feelings will go away. Now, if you're in an abusive situation right now, then you may need to make a decision. Forgiving somebody doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stay in a position where you're being abused and battered in that process of healing which it definitely is a process of overcoming all those wrong feelings sooner or later God is going to bring you to the to the point of needing to totally forgive the people that have hurt you and I know right off the bat that just sounds impossible it sounds ridiculous it sounds unfair but the bottom line is all you can do is make a decision to do what God is asking you to do and you start out by decision and one of the things you do is you begin to pray for the people that have hurt you. And you don't try to get them back. You, you put them in God's hands. And you don't like put them in God's hands while well, God will get you. But you pray for their salvation. And you, and you do what Jesus did where on the cross he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so it's very important for you that you forgive. Even though it is important for the people that have hurt you, it's more important for you. Because... That unforgiveness is like a poison and a bitterness in your soul. And your life will always be bitter until you get rid of that poison. You know, when I, when I listen to you share your story and I, I hear some of those details that you share, my heart breaks for the little girl that, yeah. that you were. And I, I see the woman of God that you are today and the, the healing that God has done. But I still think of all those people who are saying, but it won't work for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm still in that place. I'm, I'm not going to receive the healing that God gave for Joyce. God loves Joyce in a different way somehow. So 
how do you bring people to that understanding that he does not respect anyone differently than another? He has that love for all of us. Well, you know, if you're watching this DVD and you're, th and you're thinking what Ginger just said, well, you know, maybe for Joyce, but not for me. I mean, faith is a step. I mean, faith is a leap. It's like, you know, the bottom line is, I guess, is if what you're doing right now is not working, which is probably not, you wouldn't be watching this, why not take that leap of faith and say, you know what, I do believe that God can do it for me, and I do believe that God will do it for me, and I'm going to have hope. I'm going to believe. I'm going to expect something wonderful to happen in my life, and you know, something that you can do. Even if you really can't say right now that you really 100% believe that, you don't have to be phony with God. You know, take your little tiny bit of faith to God and say, you know, I believe that you exist. Uh, I believe you care about people. I'm having a hard time understanding love. Help my unbelief. But something that you can do that will help you immensely is you can begin to confess out loud what you would like to see happen in your life as long as it agrees with the Word of God. And you can take scriptures and, and you can, like, you can confess Psalm 27.10. My mother and my father have rejected me, but God will take me up and adopt me as his own child. And one of the things that I've learned recently is even scientifically, we believe there's something in our makeup, it's been proven scientifically, that we believe more of what we hear ourselves say than what anybody else says to us. And so I can say to you, God loves you, and you might think, huh, well, I sure don't feel like it. But if you will start saying about 50 times a day out loud, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, I tell you, won't be very many days and you'll start thinking, well, maybe he does love me. And you know, that's a principle that I applied in my life and it has had a lot to do with the healing that God has brought in my life because the Bible says plainly you need to call those things that be not as though they are. And as you know, or anybody who partakes of much of my teaching, that's a real central theme of my teaching is that you you have to begin to speak it and you have to begin to confess it and come into agreement with God because for so many years I was just in agreement with the enemy although I was a Christian and I went to church I would say things like I'll never amount to anything my life is always going to be a mess if only I wouldn't have been abused you know and the self pity and and you, you have to get to the point where you say you know what I can't do anything about what has happened to me and I say all the time, you know what, I didn't have a very good start in life, but I am going to have a good finish. And every one of you can have the same thing. No matter how you got started, today, right now, is a day of transition and change for you. Where you can say, I'm going to take that leap of faith, and I'm going to believe if God will do it for anybody, that he'll do it for me. Well then... Would you pray with people so that they can begin taking those steps, not on their own strength, but in God's strength? Yes. I pray that you will understand that God loves you and that no matter what has happened to you in your life, no matter how deep of a pit you're in, God will reach down in it and lift you out and he will make you whole. God can renew your mind through his word. He can heal your emotions. He can help you financially, physically, heal your body. He can give you the right friends, the right social life. God can help you, and He wants to help you. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy, but it's much easier than staying in bondage. Some things will come quick. Some will come more slowly. But the thing you have to make a decision on today is I'm going to step out on this journey by faith, and I am never going to give up. Make a decision before you ever start that you're not going to give up because God will not give up on you. And if you're really sincere and you really want this complete restoration and healing in your life, then I want you to agree with me in prayer today. And I believe it's going to start a brand new journey in your life. And I might add, some of you watching probably has never even received Christ as your Savior. And so for those who have never invited Christ into your life, I'd like to first pray a short but powerful prayer of salvation, which basically means I'm going to pray a prayer you're going to pray after me, and you're going to be inviting Jesus to come into your life. Then we're going to pray that prayer of complete healing and restoration. So let's just pray together. I'll do little short sentences, and you pray after me. Father God, I love you. Jesus, I believe in you. I need you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for me. 
I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. You paid for my sins. Jesus, I receive you now into my life. And I give myself to you right now. I surrender. I release my life to you. Take me just the way I am. And now you work with me and make me what you want me to be. I believe my sins have been forgiven. I believe I've been saved. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going to enjoy the journey. Now, God, I surrender my life for you, for you to heal me. I ask you for complete restoration and the redemption of all that's been lost in my life. I ask you to bring justice into my life for all the things that have hurt me. If I've hurt someone else, then I pray, God, that you would make that up to them and pay them back for the wrong things that I've done. Show me if there's something I can do to make it better. But I can only do it through your strength. Father God, I want this healing. But I know that I cannot do it myself. So I ask you today to heal me completely. And I will work with you and not give up until the job is completely done. Thank you for all that you have done in my life. Thank you for what you're doing right now. And thank you for all that you will do in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think you're on your way to a brand new life. And I want to close with this scripture. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of God's victory and spreads through us and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. God is going to heal you and he's going to use you to heal other people. God bless you.